Since we've made some destructive changes, we'd better save out to another file name. I know this seems a little bit obsessive, but it's really a good practice to get into. I'm going to click Save As and press the plus sign again, and now we're up to version 5. Okay, so let's go back out to the 4 viewport layout with Alt-W and dolly back out a little bit and take a look. Okay, so we've got enough here now that we can actually do a mirror operation. So we've created one back leg and one front leg and we can mirror them across the world axis. Why don't I click on nothing out here and press the Z key and the views will all zoom out to show the entire model. Okay, so if I select an object and I try to mirror it right now, I'm not going to get what I want. I want it to mirror across this x-axis and I want it to use the, uh, the origin as the point of reference for the mirror operation. So in order to do that, we have to have a better understanding of how the coordinate system tools work in 3ds Max. So you've seen the difference between world and local space, right? We're still in local space here. I can switch back into world space or view space. But you can see in world space, I have a different orientation to the move gizmo. Um, if I select the rotate tool, we'll see the same thing. I can rotate in world coordinates or I can rotate in local coordinates just to illustrate how this works. So the next level up that we need to go to here is we need to learn how to place the gizmo at a location other than the object's pivot point because that's the default. If I select this box and, and rotate it, you'll see it's going to rotate around its pivot. And if I select this one, it'll rotate around its pivot. And it doesn't matter whether we're in local space or world space, we're still going to be rotating around the pivot point, just in a different direction. So if I select both of the boxes and rotate them, you'll see here I'm getting a different result now. And that's because 3ds Max has gone and changed a uh, setting basically without my intervention. I'm going to hit Control z to undo that. Up here on the main toolbar, you've got the Use Center button. And if you click and hold that down, you'll see it's got a flyout. And it's got three mysterious options here. Okay, so the first one here is Use Pivot Point Center. Okay, use Pivot Point Center. And if I rotate two objects in that mode, you'll see they rotate both around their own pivot points. The center option is what 3ds Max chose for me automatically when I tried to rotate those two objects. So if we reactivate that, you'll see we're rotating around the common center of all of the points on both of the objects. Control Z to undo. Well, what I really want here is the third option down here, which is called Use Transform Coordinate Center. Ooh, that's a mouthful. But what that means is use whatever point of reference we've chosen here in the reference coordinate system. Okay, so since I've chosen World here, and I've chosen Use Transform Coordinate Center, take a look at the position of the Rotate Gizmo in the perspective view. It's right at the origin because we've chosen world as our reference and then we've placed the center of the transform gizmo at the world origin. Okay, so now if I rotate that, you'll see they're going to spin around the origin. Okay, so in order to accomplish what we're trying to do with the mirror, what we've got to do is we've got to choose the move tool switch it into World Coordinates, and then finally choose Use Transform Coordinate Center. And now if you tumble around or orbit around in your view, you'll see the Move Gizmo is positioned at the origin, and that's exactly what we need. All right, now we're in a good place to do our mirror. Okay, so I've got both of them selected because I can do them both at once, in fact. And finally, I'm going to go to the Tools menu, and I'm looking for Mirror. There it is, Mirror. And when I open it up, the two objects will move over to the other side. I just want to choose the option here that says Instance. What is an instance? An instance is a copy that shares a modifier stack. 
So you could even think of it as an object that's in two places at once. And when I click OK here, we can play around with these to see instancing in effect. I can select either one of these uh, front legs and do things like play around with the taper and you can see it's affecting both. So that's an instance in action. And this is also an instance here. It's just we've converted it to editable poly. You'll know that it's an instance because it'll be highlighted in bold up in your modifier stack. And if I went in and, for example, selected polygons and move them around, you'll see that it's, it's operating on both of them. Control Z to undo that. Instancing is very powerful, especially if you've got a lot of identical objects in your scene. Cool. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit Control S and just save the current file. We're now ready to create the ladder back pieces for the chair. Go back to the reference and check that out. So I've got a thicker piece up the top and a couple narrower pieces. But if we look really closely at this, you'll notice that it's got a little bit of um, a chamfer to it. So I'm going to use a chamfer box primitive to create these ladder back pieces. That'll give me the ability to create a simple chamfered object without having too much muss or fuss. In my create panel under geometry, Instead of standard primitives, I'm going to choose extended primitives. And now I've got chamfer box. Now this is a bit tricky when you first do it. Like all these primitives, you have to click and drag in a very specific, almost ritualistic manner in order to get the correct result. So stick with me here. What you've got to do is activate chamfer box. Click and drag holding down the mouse to set the footprint, just like a regular box. Release the mouse and drag upward without pressing the button down. Okay, And then left mouse click and without pressing the button down, drag again and now you're setting the fillet radius. And we can change that later but we just have to have something there to begin. So once I get that visible, I'll left click once again to complete the box, and then I can right click to complete the tool. So that was a bit weird. You might need to rewind the video and look at that again, but uh, you have to click and drag in a really specific manner. Then I can go to the modify panel and play around with this. Uh, why don't I start by selecting my move tool and sending it to an X value of zero and reducing obviously the length and width something reasonable. The height clearly is way too high. Go to my front view and just move that up. Go to the left view, right clicking in the view so that I don't lose my selection. Move it back. And here we're going to definitely need to get close in on here. For the fillet segments I only need one. We're going to simplify this. The fillet amount, a very low amount, very low, And then we can dial in the length and width a little bit more precisely. So maybe the length could be just an inch, perhaps. So that's really the thickness of the wood in this case. The width maybe a little bit more. Uh, the height a little bit less. Getting in closer. And sort of doing a first pass at hacking this out. Clearly, I'm going to need segments here because I've got no segmentation and yeah, I've got to have some bend there to this. So as you see, it's got a curve there. So we need more segments here. So how many do I need? Not that many. Not any in the length here. None. Just one there. With. Aha. So how many do we need? I'm going to say maybe eight segments. It's probably good enough. 